out of the shadows and out from hiding. A man who's lived a secret life for 12 years. On his back, a black power tattoo. It's been removed, but still it leaves the mark of a faded past life not quite forgotten. He's a wanted man, a gang leader turned police narc, who gave evidence against criminals everyone else was scared of. He spent more than a decade on the witness protection program. And until now, he's been faceless. I'm your bullseye. I'm your face of witness protection. Why? Because it needs a face. That's all. He's been living under a false name and in a secret location. But now he wants the world to know he's Arthur Garlick, past president of Black Power Taranaki. What I am is what I am, you know. And who I am is who I am. I can't be any You can call me late for breakfast, mate, but I'm still going to be Arthur Garlick. I'm proud of being Arthur Garlick. Witness protection may have kept him alive, but it's turned him into a liar and forced him into isolation. And now the black belt karate man is fighting back. He's speaking out, knowing he's putting his life in danger. Mate, they may get the body, but I'll never get the way to it. I'll never get the spirit. Doesn't mean shit. So great is the risk to Arthur's life that he agrees to meet us only in secret locations. Now nearly 50, Arthur was patched with the black power at just 15. The gang gave him a sense of family he didn't have at home. I, I had no one. At, at a younger fella, I, I got beaten up. It wasn't my family coming to pick me up. Actually, it was a couple of them that helped put the boot in. The family, your family? Uh -huh. But, and it was the blacks who picked me up, so naturally. I ended up with them. That was a good old day, mate. The 70s and 80s were high times in Arthur's hometown of New Plymouth. Murders, robberies and attacks were commonplace, and the black power had a stronghold over the area. Arthur was in the thick of it, but hasn't got any serious convictions. What kind of gang member were you? Uh, uh, Mr. Meaners. What's the worst thing you've ever done? Um, I think a disorderly behaviour or something. I don't think I've ever been charged for assault. Any aggravated robberies? No, not interested. What's the point? Rape? F way. Murder? No. Would you ever think there was an opportunity that you'd be capable of that? Well, everyone's got the right to defend themselves and their family and their property, mate. Arthur was a family man who was running a successful firewood business, he says. But he was also hanging with the bros and moving drugs. Just cannabis? Yep. Cannabis. I'm not into anything else. Don't like any of that other shit. But by the 1990s, things began to change. Gang violence and retribution were commonplace. And Arthur was getting sick of gang life. He wanted out. Not for himself, but for his wife and six kids. And giving evidence for the cops would be an extreme way of making his exit. In 1991, the bros from Arthur's chapter were involved in the murder of a mongrel mob member, Robert Jillings. A black power boss was jailed for the Jillings murder, but a second gang member walked free after intimidating a witness. Years later, he would be jailed for perverting the course of justice. But it didn't end there. A police witness in the Jillings murder, Chris Crean, was gunned down on his doorstep before he got the chance to give evidence. Again, the black power in Taranaki was behind the hit. You were the president. You knew it was going to happen. Why didn't you stop them? Yeah, well, same thing as, as they call it power vitae, don't they? Who, you know, they try to say that I had power vitae. Patch members will do what patch members want to do. After the killing, several gang members were brought in. 
and it's gang law that no one owns up or points the finger at any of their bros. Arthur, seen here in this photo with his back to us, was among those rounded up by police. During the interview, he was offered a new life. In exchange for information, he'd get immunity from prosecution. The deal was he'd give the evidence without being implicated in the murder. He had a night in jail to think about it. Arthur Garlick's decision would make criminal history. For the first time, a gang president turned Queen's evidence. Explain why you felt so strongly about basically betraying your bros. Um, actually, you know, people, that's, that's a good question. Pe me betrayed my bros or did they betray me? Well, you were the one that gave evidence against them. I re-empowered the community. Empowerment. Kapu te mana. His information was crucial to three High Court trials and would ultimately lead to five of his own men getting hefty jail sentences. Arthur says what helped him make up his mind was that his own men were prepared to kill Chris Crean when he had a baby in his arms. I still can't shake the shuddering feeling of kill the f***ing kid as well. It's the only thing that did it for me. You can't f***ing threaten to kill children. No, wait, I don't care whose they are. And now that he'd swapped sides, the men who had been Arthur's brothers for 25 years were now his hunters. But it's the worst thing is turning your back on the people that had given you. Taken from me. They don't give me shit. They, they talk a lot. Take us, mate. Move us and shake us. Witness protection swooped in and took the family out of Taranaki. Um, I left New Plymouth in a pair of gum boots. Your, where was your family? They were with me. What did they leave with? What they had on their backs, basically, and a couple of suitcases. A lolly jar on them. Arthur and his family were kept on the move around New Zealand for nearly two years until he had given his evidence at the Korean trial. What was that like? Oh, it was just shocking, mate. What happened? Oh, I just shunted from place to place to place to place. From one dwelling to another dwelling to another dwelling. All the time taking your kids? Oh, yeah, we all move all together. And then Arthur, his wife and the kids were given new identities and moved offshore. From that day, they were never to use their old names, speak of their past, or come home again. Well, I had to ask my wife, and she wasn't happy at all, but she knew it's the right thing. She had to take on another identity. Your kids had to take on another identity. It was a big decision that you made. We've all had to. Arthur's eldest son, who we will call Lee, was 19 at the time. Today, he's nearly 30, but he still struggles with his new identity. How do I feel about it? Well, I feel I don't have a choice in the matter. I just, I had to get out of there. You could take it two ways. You could either be very angry about it and not do anything with your life, or you can just choose to hit the reset button. And you chose to hit the reset button? I'm doing it every day. All the rest of the family were too scared to speak, even with their faces hidden. And the impact of Arthur's decision goes even further. It's the people who are still back there that I worry about. Like, I haven't seen that any family for ten years, and I doubt I will see them. Do you resent your father for bringing this on the family? Um, he done what he saw was right at the time. People have choices in their life, and that was a choice that he made. Police would have nothing to do with the story, but we do know no one has paid a reward for turning Queen's evidence, only legitimate expenses. Arthur says he got about 40000 as compensation for the loss of some vehicles and for the sale of his business. And for his service, a one-page letter of thanks from the then police commissioner, Peter Doon. I can't even swap it for a nice juicy apple and a piece of decent paper to wipe my ass after I eat it. I stood up for my country, stood up for the Crown. I've done that. 
I now have got life in exile. I need a hand. Who do I turn to? If I can't turn back on the bloody system that I served and other people I know have served and have been shunted, then who do I turn to? After 12 years of living a lie, Arthur's had enough. He misses his extended family and his homeland. I've lost my family. Yeah. My sister to breast cancer. And I lost my mother who I only got to know after this shit went down. Can't go to Tungis. And, and sometimes it's not the Tungis because you know they're coming. But it's the other, it's the good times. The 21st, the birthday parties, the Sunday lunches. Those things I lost, what's makes what will make me go on. Arthur says he and his family were just abandoned in his new country, with no ongoing support or contact from the people who moved him there. I think they should get off their butts and do their jobs properly. What How much money is spent on rehabilitating the offenders, the perpetrators? What about us? We know of two fellow gangsters who also went into protection with Arthur after giving evidence in the same trial. One agreed to meet us off camera, but says he's gone bush because he fears for his life so much. We tried to find the third man, but no one knows his whereabouts or even if he's still alive. Why? So they think that they can just dump people in other countries and wipe their hands off them and then when that person rings back up and says, look, I've got a problem here, I've come down with this or I've come down with that, can you help us out? And basically you get the cold shoulder. Arthur says he doesn't regret his decision, but sometimes wonders whether the men he put away have ended up with the easier life. Who's doing life? Never mind where you're doing it. I tell you what, if anyone out there ever wants the easy way out, go to jail. I'm telling you. Mate, you think about it, if I'd have decided, now, nah, this, I'd just was keep my fucking mouth shut, I'll go to jail, I might even get ten times, I might have even got what they got. Would have I wanted for anything? Do you think I would have had to struggle to get a blowjob? You know? No. Nah. Would have I struggled to get stone? Not at all. Why? Can you answer that? Why? Why do you think? Because I was the f***ing president. I was one of the boys. Tama too. It's part of it now, Arthur, that over here, you're nobody, really. You're lost in this land that people don't know you. You don't have that mana. Well, I have mana, all right, because I have ihi, heaps of ihi. Arthur also says he needs money. He says he's suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder after the relocation and can't keep a job. What do you need? A couple of hundred thousand. It's not a lot to ask after 12 years. The cops would laugh at you. Well, the police can laugh. As far as I'm concerned, the police have done what the police do. They've done the prosecution. Witness protection, if I'm still alive. They've done what they do. But what is money going to do for you? I can't service my debts. I've got post-traumatic stress disorder. Part of it is being diagnosed down to lack of duty of care from New Zealand. I'm living in exile for life. I've got life in exile. Despite what his new passport says, he will always be Arthur Garlick. And all this Kiwi man wants is to come home. He's kept his mouth shut for years, but it was quietly killing him. And now that the silence is broken, he knows the sound of his own voice may prove to be fatal. At the end of the day, I've done the right thing by my country. I've done the right thing by the Crown. Man, if they blow me away, they blow me away. But then it's over. 
everyone's free.